بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه والسن بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to the thirteenth class of the Islamic faith and <clears throat> the last thing we talked about was a description of what Iman is because we spoke about uh, Iman and Kufr and the things that a person nullifies his Islam with and then we went into the chapter that deals that with the fact that Iman is a combination. It's a cocktail of conviction, belief, which is of the heart, rhetoric, the things that we say, and actions, the things that we do with our limbs and the deeds that we um, perform. So now we stopped where the Sheikh says faith may increase or decrease and may be removed altogether. It is increased by practicing what the religion prescribes and recommends and it, it, it is decreased by committing sin. It is not removed, that is entirely, except by the disbelief and associating partners with Allah. Allah the Almighty says, true believers are only those whose hearts are filled with awe whenever Allah is mentioned and whose faith is strengthened whenever his revelations are recited to them. Also, the believers may grow yet more firm in their faith. Also, Allah says, it is he who sent down tranquility into the hearts of the believers so that they may grow more firm in their faith. All of these evidences and many more indicate a fact. And this is crucial for a person who wants to be part of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah to believe in. And this point is as follows. When we say Iman, Immediately we think the six pillars of Iman. To believe in Allah, to believe in the Day of Judgment, to believe in the angels, the messengers, the holy scriptures, and in the predestiny, whether good or bad. When actually Iman is in addition to this classification is also, as the Prophet said, والسلام, composed of 60 plus branches. In another narration, 70 plus branches. The highest is La ilaha illallah. And this is something that is said and believed. And the lowest is removing obstacles from or harmful thing from people's path or way and bashfulness shyness is a branch of iman so we have actions removing things we have bashfulness which is something in the heart that cascades on the body and also we have iman as a totality or a description that is opposed to shirk or kufr. Now where 
did people go wrong? To the extent that we have so many sects in Islam and cults. One major part of them going wrong is when it comes to the definition and understanding of Iman. What is Iman? Muslims, let, let me rephrase that. Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, as we've just read, faith may increase or decrease. So the level of your Iman can go up and can go down. And the three verses that we have read to you, it clearly indicates that this is a fact, so that their Iman would grow, so that their Iman would increase. And it's there in the Quran. And there are so many other evidences supporting this. Now, we have two opposing major sects, divisions in Islam. We have Al-Khawarij and we have Al-Murji'ah. And strangely enough, their belief, though contradicting 180 degrees to one another, yet they meet and agree on one concept regarding the definition of Iman. And what is that? They believe that Iman is a package deal. Either it is there fully or it is not there at all. Unlike Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah who believe that it can increase and can decrease. So the essence of Iman is there. It can grow to be complete and it can diminish until it is small, but still it is there. And this is why the Shaykh says um, in the third line, it is not removed, Iman, totally, it is not removed, where we can say that this individual is not a Muslim. It is not removed except by disbelief and associating partners with Allah Azza wa Jal. And we will come to discuss this issue a while, inshallah. Coming back to our point, Khawarij and Murji'a. They both believe that Iman is a whole. This they agree upon. But what nullifies it, they differ. So for example, the Khawarij, they say, yes, Iman is a whole. If you do one single major sin, this is an indication that there is no Iman in your heart. Hence, you are a kafir and in hellfire for eternity. Whoa, that's frightening. So if I lie, you're in hell. Not only that, you're a kafir, you're a disbeliever. I can chop your head off. I can take your money. What is this? If someone drinks intoxicants, he's a kafir. He's in hell forever. Why? It says because Iman is a package deal. By breaching some of it, the whole thing is nullified. Okay. Mu'tazila are a bit like the Khawarij, but they were a little bit more specific. They said, yes, if you commit a major sin, if you fornicate, if you steal money, all of these are major sins, then you are stripped of the title mu'min, believer. But we don't say that you're a kafir. Excuse me? <laughs> How is this possible? Yeah, we say that there is an area in between mu'min and kafir. This area is for those who commit major sins. Okay, that's nice to know. Well, actually, it's not that nice because we believe, Mu'tazila say, that by committing a major sin, 
you will abide in hellfire for eternity. Whoa, so you're like the Khawarij. Unfortunately, as a conclusion, yes. But no, we don't say you're a kafir. Yeah, but the end result is I'm in hell forever with the kafir. So what's, what's the difference? And how dare you say such a thing when Allah says, إن الله لا يغفر أن يشرك به ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء. Allah does not forgive those who associate others with Him, but He forgives whatsoever below that to whomever He wishes. So they come up with arguments, etc., but it doesn't work. Nobody buys it. This is not part of Islam. This is not from the methodology of Ahlul Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. So let's go to the other party, Al Murji'a. Murji'a says, yes, Iman is a package deal. Okay, so do you share the same belief of the Khawarij? No, 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 no. On the contrary, we give you a carte blanche. Do whatever you want of major sins. You can do the whole nine yards. As long as you have Iman in your heart and it's firm, then you're safe. Whoa. So if I don't pray, you're a believer. You're kidding me. If I consume intoxicants and do drugs, you're still a believer. Do you have Islam in your heart? Do you believe in Allah Azza wa Yes, I do. You're clear. So if I fornicate, party all night long, go clubbing, do whatever I want, you're a believer exactly like Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali's belief. And of course, this is pathetic. This is nonsense. It's insane. It has nothing to do with Islam. And this is unfortunately what the vast majority of Muslims nowadays believe. As long as I am mu'min, it doesn't matter what I do. Allah Azza wa Jal loves me. Allah Azza wa Jal will protect me. Allah Azza wa Jal would forgive my sins. And part of them say that my Iman is exactly the same as the Iman of Jibril, the Archangel, peace be upon him. So, I could do whatever I want. Where did this come from? It came from their ignorance of the Quran and the Sunnah. In addition to the philosophies of the Greeks that were, that were imported at the beginning of the Abbasi Caliphate, when the Muslims have conquered so many lands and knowledge was booming, and this, is, this was the golden era for the Muslims in scientific discoveries, in expansion of territory, in wealth pouring to them, to the extent that one of the, uh, one of the Abbasi Caliphates, caliphs, he said that whoever translates a book from Greek to Arabic, whether it is philosophy, Aristotle, or whatever his name is, and uh, uh, the others, Pluto, I don't know their, their names in English, we, we didn't get a chance to exchange business cards, but Aflaton, Aristo in Arabic. So, whoever translates such a book, he gives him his weight in gold. So people went like crazy, translating books that had sh pure shirk, pure kufr. Who cares? Who's monitoring? This is a Greek book by a famous theologian, by a famous philosopher, and we're getting paid. So it's a win-win to us. This caused huge damage.
to the Muslims because they started adapting these philosophies and talking about Islam from such a perspective, which led to innovations, which led to shirk, which led to deviant beliefs. So both got it from the same source. This is why we study Aqidah, to purify our beliefs according to the Quran and the Sunnah, not according to philosophers. Now, we don't want to make this too complicated because to a lot of the non-Arabs and to some Arabs, this is boring. So many philosophies, so many things. We would like to stay focused on making it simple. So my conviction would not be distorted by so many sects and cults and what they believe and what not to believe. Nevertheless, it is important to share with you how such deviations started without going into deep details so that you know how Allah privileged you when you follow the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, which is natural, which is pure and simple. The Shaykh says, no one's belief is confirmed after one has been a disbeliever except by. So a person who's a kafir reverts to Islam. We cannot confirm his Islam except with the following. Number one, belief, which combines the heart's word. Again, the translator used the word mind when it should have been heart. This is the Islamic terminology used in Arabic. So we should stick with it so that you don't get confused because we have mind reading, we have mind uh, um, uh, thoughts, etc. When what counts in Islamic terminology is the heart. So no one's belief is confirmed after he, uh, one has been a disbeliever except by one belief which combines the heart's word and acceptance of the divine message with the heart's actions, which is to love Allah and his messenger and to love what Allah and his messengers love. So this we spoke about last class, that the heart has a saying, the heart has a conviction, the heart has actions of its own. Number two, declaration by the word of mouth. Number three, physical action. Now, these three are important in order to be a true believer. And watch out. We are talking about a theoretical, theoretical concept. We're talking about generalities. We're not talking about, about an individual. And why am I saying this disclaimer? Because when you go into studying these things, shaitan <clears throat> may make you jump to conclusion and makes you th say, oh, Sheikh Asim says that we have to have the conviction, which is the belief and the rhetoric of the tongue and the actions. So if someone does not do the actions, then he's a kafir. So my friend is a kafir because he doesn't do so-and-so. He doesn't pray. It's a total different ball game. In totality, in general, the concept is clear. You have to have the belief, you have to say it, and you have to act upon it. If you don't act upon it at all, and this is in general terms, someone who says, yes, I'm a Muslim. I believe in my heart that Prophet Muhammad is truthful and that the Quran is the word of Allah. I have no problem in that. Okay, why don't you pray? No, I don't want to pray. 
but I believe. Why don't you fast? I don't want to fast. Why don't you refrain from haram? Because I don't have to. Now, this person is not a Muslim. I cannot go to my neighbor or to my brother or to my cousin who doesn't pray, doesn't fast Ramadan, and does all the sins and say, you're a kafir. Because here we have to fulfill the conditions, one, two, three, four, and we have to ensure that there are no obstacles available to prevent me from giving tak takfir, one, two, three, four. And this is a process that scholars, Muslim judges, Muslim ruler are entitled to do, not us laymen. We're talking about the general concept. So you have to have these three things available to be a believer. Let's go on and, and, and read what the Sheikh uh, says. Whoever mentally, this is by the heart, accepts the faith and is able to make the verbal declaration, but does not do so, he's not a believer. And this is very important. A man proposes to my sister, and he's a revert. And he said, yes, I am a Muslim, I believe in Islam, and I do this and I do this. I said, okay, did you read the Shahada in the Islamic Center? He said, no. Did you read the Shahada in front of Muslims? He said, no. Okay, why don't you declare your Islam? Um, yeah, I will, I will. When? Inshallah, inshallah, I will declare Islam. Akhi, you're not a Muslim. He said, yeah, I'm Muslim. I believe in my heart. You have to declare Islam. No, this is judging me. You're judging me. And you're interfering in my own affairs. I told you I'm a Muslim. If you don't say, لا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله in Arabic, verbally, in front of people, you're not a Muslim. How dare you? I'm a Muslim. I believe in Allah, in the Quran. I've read so many books. I've done this and that. You refuse to say la ilaha illallah. Even if you have conviction in your heart, it doesn't work. You have to say la ilaha illallah. So whoever mentally accepts the faith, faith and is able to make the verbal declaration but does not do so, is not a believer. He's not a Muslim. End of story. You refuse to say it. You're not a Muslim. Similarly, a person who mentally accepts the faith and utters the verbal declaration. Okay, this guy accepts with his heart, says la ilaha illallah verbally, and is able to do the actions that are particular to Islamic faith but does not do them, is also not a believer. So he comes and says, okay, uncle, I'd like to marry your daughter, your, sis your sister, whatever. I'm a revert, I'm a Muslim. He said, MashaAllah, your declaration of uh, Islam, yes, this is my certificate. I said it in the Islamic center in front of 5,000 people. Good, good for you. So do you pray? No. Do you fast? No, 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 not yet. Do you read the Quran? He said, no. Um... Do you refrain from doing sins? I said, no, it's okay. I, ha I still ha do uh, weeds. You know, I, I smoke pot and I party event uh, every now and then. I celebrate Christmas. And so, so where is your actions as a Muslim? Um, I believe in Allah and the Prophet and I say the shahada. No, Akhi, you have to walk the talk. Now, my sister says, why are you doing this? We want to get married. We want to get things halal. You get married to a Muslim. The guy doesn't do anything related to the actions of the body. And without that, he is not a believer. He's not doing any of the Sharia aspects of Islam. Nothing. And he cannot be Muslim until he starts to practice. Now, there is a difference between general practice and specifics. I'm not talking that this person becomes a full-fledged 
mu'min, like the companions doing everything in Islam. No, we are all sinners and we have our shortcomings. So yeah, he may default on some of the aspects of Islam. He may not be able to abandon certain sins. He may be weak in practicing some rituals, some mandatory acts. But in general, in totality, he's doing his level best to practicing Islam. This is different from someone who refrains from practicing anything that is mentioned in uh, uh, Islam. Now, on the other hand, the Sheikh says, whoever wants to utter the declaration or to do the actions, but is unable to accomplish his purpose, falls under what Allah says, Allah does not charge a soul with more than it can bear. And Allah says, Allah does not burden anyone with more than he has given them. Which means, we're talking about someone who's selective, by choice, not to practice Islam. So someone comes to us and says, I'm a Muslim. I want to become, a, 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 I'm a Muslim and a practicing Muslim, but I cannot say the Shahada. Why? Because I'm mute, I can't speak. He says, okay. Or someone who says, I cannot fast because chronically I'm ill. I have ulcers, I have huge uh, um, and, 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 and very bad case of diabetes. I have to eat every couple of hours or my insulin goes down and I die. He says, okay, this is a different story altogether because Allah doesn't burden you beyond what you cannot bear. So you have no problem in that. Our problem is with someone who can practice but refuses to. If a Muslim does something that annuls his faith, that nullifies, that breaks his iman, whether verbal, physical, or mental, his faith is totally annulled. So what does that mean? The things that nullify Islam can be by conviction, can be by rhetoric, and can be by actions. So I, as a Muslim, if I believe that someone else can know the unseen other than Allah, can predict my future, and I believe in that, this nullifies my Islam. Even if I say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, even if I pray. Because the conviction goes against Islam and confirms that other than Allah can know the unseen, other than Allah can provide for me, other than Allah can give life and death, etc. In the heart. I didn't say anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. Now, likewise, if someone has the strong conviction that fills his heart with Iman, but he says things that are kufr or shirk. So, yeah, he's a believer and he prays on time, but when he speaks, he says blasphemous things. So he says a joke, mocking Islam, mocking Quran, mocking the Prophet ﷺ, makes fun of hijab, makes fun of the Muslim men, when they perform hajj and they shave their heads according to what Allah ordered them in the Quran. And he makes fun of that. These things are said by the tongue. And these things 
nullify a person's Islam. As Allah mentioned in Ayah 66, in Chapter 9, Surah At-Tawbah, لا تعتذروا Do not apologize. قد كفرتم بعد إيمانكم You have committed kufr and disbelief after being believers. Now you're not, not a believers anymore. And this is only by the tongue. So like when you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, you enter the circle of Islam and you're one of us, you're a brother to us. Likewise, when you say the word of kufr, you exit the fold of Islam. Someone has conviction in his heart and he never says any kufr with his tongue, but he steps willingly and intentionally on the Quran. He prostrates to an idol, glorifying it. He does things through action that nullifies his Islam. Then he is a kafir. So, if a Muslim does something that annuls his faith, whether verbal, physical, or mental, his faith is totally annulled. As we have said, words, action, and belief together constitute faith and are compared to the three rak'ahs of Maghrib. If a worshiper does something that invalidates his prayer in one rak'ah, the whole prayer as a unit is invalidated. Even, even though he might have prayed the other rak'ahs well. So this is something that many people think that this is not logical. I have conviction in my, my heart. I am saying the word of Islam. Yes, I'm short in acting upon it. And you say that this nullifies my Islam. As I explained earlier, it's a package deal in the sense that your actions must be a representation of what's in your heart. If you totally abandon things that the Sharia tells you to do, and you commit things that the Sharia tells you not to do in totality, not small things, but the whole thing, this means that you are not a true Muslim. So likewise in Maghrib, if you pray the first rak'ah excellently, the second rak'ah beautifully, the third rak'ah you pass wind. The whole prayer is void. You have to repeat the wudu and your prayer. This does not contradict what we have said that faith increases with offering more of what Islam requires and decreases with committing sinful actions, be they less or more serious. So, again, this is a great cause of confusion to people who do not have knowledge. Many times in counseling sessions, I get with men and women saying that this is not kufr. So no, this is sinful. Yes, but I'm enjoying the sin. This is not kufr. Guys, this is not kufr. This is a sin. There is a difference between a sin that decreases iman and worships forms of worship that increase Iman, and there is something that nullifies your Iman altogether. Sins are not like this. Sins that are related to human nature reduce your Iman. Sins that are related to the core of Iman, such as stepping on the Qur'an intentionally, insulting the Prophet والسلام, These nullify the core of Iman, and this nullifies Islam in totality. So, likewise, 
the fact that all of a prayer is rendered invalid by doing one thing that is contrary to it does not contradict that it is greater and better when more of its good action is done. What does that mean? Now, if you nullify part of your prayer through passing wind, through giving your back to the Qibla, through talking, this nullifies your prayer. Likewise, your prayer, which is similar to Iman, can be increased in value and can be decreased while the prayer itself is valid. The Sheikh says that it is greater and better when more of its good action is done, such as longer rec recitation of the Quran, stillness and glorification of Allah. If I recite the Quran longer while in prayer, does this add more reward to my prayer? The answer is yes. So if I recite shorter surahs, the reward is less. But the prayer itself is not, the validity of the prayer itself is intact. As in the case of Iman being reduced or increased. So the Shaykh says, It is a lesser prayer, but not invalid. If one does what is discouraged, what is makru, such as looking to the sky during, during prayer. So while I'm praying, I do this. Does, this, does, does that invalidate my prayer? No. But definitely it decreases the reward of your prayer. And or stretching one's arms on the floor when entering the prostration position. So one puts his whole hand and arm and elbow on the ground when prostrating like a dog or like a beast. This is makruh but it does not invalidate your prayer. Nothing invalidates faith except what Allah has stated in the same way that nothing invalidates prayer except what Allah has defined. So I hope this clarifies a little bit of the concept of Iman being composed of belief of the heart and the belief of the heart is composed of saying and acting. And also the saying of the tongue and the acting of the body. These are a combination that must be present in general or in totality in order for someone to be a believer. He may increase in his belief according to the acts he does or decrease his belief according to the acts he does not do. But the core is still a believer in totality. Unlike when someone nullifies his belief, whether by the actions of the heart or by his rhetoric or by the actions of his body, as we have explained and Allah Azza wa Jal knows uh, best. So we have um, like 20 minutes for the questions and question number one. Rabia says, I was wondering if it is permissible to say, that is to add, Allahumma Ameen, after the recitation of Sayyidul Istighfar, and also while reciting the Qur'an, the verses where there is a dua of the, prophet, of the prophets are written. Is it permissible to say Ameen after the recitation of it? Ameen means, O oh Allah, answer my dua. Or, O oh Allah, respond to my dua. And... The sunnah and the best way of a Muslim is to follow what the Prophet ﷺ used to do. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ, when he used to make dua, he would never conclude his dua with Amin. 
when he says Allahumma ghafir li ma qaddamtu wa ma akhartu wa ma asrartu wa ma a'lantu beautiful duas he never says at the end amin so for us to say amin would not be recommended if we did not say that this is an innovation because definitely the prophet sallam would only say and do what is best and if he didn't do it then we shouldn't do it he used to say amin in salat ghayr al maghdub alayhim wal dallin amin and the companions used to say amin whenever he makes dua or someone makes dua and we say amin in response to that someone's dua but for us to say amin to our own dua or whenever we recite a verse of the quran rabbana atina fid dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab an nar we say amin after reciting this ayah this is not from the sunnah and we must avoid this and not do it fahad says folding clothes in the prayer is this like is it disliked act or prohibited what is the difference between disliked act or prohibited makruh and haram so makruh is what a person does and he's not sinful but if he abandons it for the sake of allah he's rewarded and likewise muharram or haram if a person does it he's sinful but if he leaves it for the sake of allah he's rewarded so he's asking now folding the clothes for prayer is this considered to be disliked or prohibited the jurors differed because in essence as the scholars of usulul fiqh say that whenever a prohibition is stated then this is by default something that is sinful unless other evidences from the quran or the sunnah would demote it into makruh so for example when the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam prohibits us from drinking while standing up there is a prohibition there is a hadith so what is the ruling on, on that the default is the prohibition do not drink standing up means that it is prohibited and you're sinful if you do it now this prohibition was actually let's start from the bottom this prohibition was promoted and made less in severity into makruh and some say into even permissible when the prophet himself alayhi salatu wasalam as in sahih al bukhari drank zamzam water while standing up so now we have two sort of conflicting evidences don't drink standing up and he drank standing up so let's see what the companions say we go also in sahih al-bukhari and find that ali ibn abi talib may allah be pleased with him the fourth caliph the cousin of the prophet as-salam and the son-in-law of the prophet as-salam the the husband of fatima he says i don't care whether i drink standing up or sitting down for i had seen the prophet alayhi salam drink standing up so what does that tell us it tells us that drinking standing up is not haram however it is definitely more rewarding to st- to drink sitting down due to the prohibition in the beginning not to drink standing up 
So likewise, when we come to the hadith that do not fold your clothes when you want to pray, the default is this is an instruction, an order not to do something, which means it is prohibited and sinful unless proven otherwise. Do we have any proof? Technically speaking, no. However, the majority of scholars say that this is not sinful, rather it is makruh. Where did they get this understanding from? Do they have any evidences? The answer is no, but the jurors tend to demote or promote a ruling if they could not find the reason or the justification for it. So they say that, ah, oh, this is something that is related to nothing of halal and haram. Rather, it is humanly better. Where did you get this from? I don't know. It sounded good. So they say, yeah, it sounds good. Okay, you agree, I agree, you agree, I agree. So the majority say, for example, eating with your left hand is makruh. What? The hadith is crystal clear. Yeah, it is crystal clear, but we don't know the point to make it haram. So we say that it is makruh. And sometimes by them saying makruh, like in the Hanafi school of thought, they have two types of makruh. Makruh, not recommended, and makruh, prohibited. They call it karahatu tahrim or karahatu tanzih. And this is something that a student of knowledge has to be careful when studying so that he would learn the terminology used by the jurors of a particular school of thought in, uh, before jumping to conclusions. So the default is the hadith is crystal clear. It is prohibited to fold your clothes when you pray. So part of the folding of the clothes is this. If I am doing this, and just before prayer, I do this. This is folding. I should not do that and pray like that. Folding your sleeves. I should not do that. One says, okay, Sheikh, what about if I have my pants below my ankles? I say, Akhi, 24-7, you're sinful, whether you're praying or not. But due to the fact that prayer, one has to do the level best not to be in a state of sin, we tell you, you've you got to fold this because it's the lesser of the two evils. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Kinza Riyaz says, Sheikh, can I gift my non-practicing cousin bags they do not cover? You give me idea what gift can I give to them so that they don't cover and they are my kinship. First of all, it is prohibited for us to assist and facilitate sin. So if I know that a friend smokes, I cannot buy him an ashtray or a lighter because I'm facilitating the sin. Likewise, if I know that my sister does not cover her face, does not wear the niqab, I cannot buy her makeup, knowing that she's going to wear makeup and go out. If my niece is not a hijabi, unfortunately, I cannot buy her perfumes because I know she's going to wear the perfumes and go out. She has no restrictions towards that. Therefore, buying a bag, would it fall under the category of tabarruj? The answer is no. 
All women, even niqabis, hijabis, they wear their backs. They're pursed. So there's nothing wrong in that because it's not related to hijab. But yes, if you tell me I'd like to buy my cousin, female cousin, something that she would use where none mahram can see her, that would not be permissible and I hope this answers your question. Tazreen says, if I'm away from my city and I am in a hotel where there is a masjid nearby, does Friday prayer, the Jumu'ah, becomes mandatory upon me even as a traveler? This is an issue of dispute. A lot of the jurors say that a traveler is exempted from praying Friday prayers. Now, in order to understand the whole issue, we have the concept of a traveler who's traveling from point A to point B. So this journey of his, he may pass by a village, a town, a city, but he's just on his journey, he's traveling, he's not settling, he's not staying or spending the night. Such a traveler, even if he passes by an area where the Friday is given, he's not obliged to pray because he's on his journey. A group of travelers, a hundred, on a boat or a ship, a cruiser ship, traveling from Cyprus to Mekanos in Greece, or to Rhodes, <laughs> Mekanos is not good, Rhodes Island. And it's Jum'a time. So they say, like, listen, we are 500 people, Muslims. Let's pray Jum'a. said, no, this is not permissible. And if you pray Jum'a, it's invalid. What? Yes, it's invalid. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ traveled a lot. And so many times Jum'a was there and he never collected his companions who were with him. On a, in an army, uh, an expedition, or whatever, and he never threw a Friday prayer. Not only that, during Arafah, in the Hajj, where tens of thousands of people were there, and it was time for Jumu'ah, it's a Friday, the Prophet did not order the congregation to pray Jumu'ah, rather he prayed Dhuhr two rakahs combined to it afterwards, Asr two rakahs. So a traveler does not pray Jumu'ah. Scenario number two. I'm traveling from London to New York. I arrived on Thursday, Friday. I'm staying there for a couple of days maybe. And then tomorrow is a Friday. And there's a masjid nearby. Should I pray or not? A lot of the scholars said that you're a traveler. You don't have to pray. But the most authentic opinion is that as long as you are in the town or the city and you're not commuting, you're not traveling, and there's a masjid next to you, Allah Azza wa Jal says in the surah, called al jumuah the Friday prayer, or the Friday day. Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا نُودِي لِلصَّلَةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ O you who believe, whenever the call for Friday is given, then you should walk and pray it. So now, I, who is in my hotel room, in New York, or in Moscow, 
Oren, whatever, and the masjid is next door or nearby, do I have to pray? The answer is yes. Because you're a believer and Allah has made the call for you as a believer to go and pray with the Muslims. So this, inshallah, gives you a background where the jurors who said, no, you don't pray, came from. And also it gives you a background where those who said, you must pray, are coming from. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Last question of today. Afrina says, is video permissible for women? We are going to have a picnic party of some of my close surrounding friends, all females. Can we make a video on this? It's an issue of dispute. And the most authentic opinion, and this is what I have adopted throughout the years, is that taking photographs or videos of women is not permissible unless it is for a legitimate reason, such as identification uh, and the likes. Why? Because women's photographs and videos defy the purpose of hijab. So the sisters say, okay, but nobody's going to see it except me. And this is why you end up seeing a lot of the sisters doing this in front of a mirror, showing their six packs, showing their how beautiful ha their head is. I've seen teenagers spending hours in front of the camera and pretending to be bloggers or vloggers with a V. And this is what you do when you put your eyelashes. And this is what you do when you put the makeup, what, what, put the foundation first. And they spend hours video, videoing themselves. Islamically, this is not permissible. Just to say, why? We're going to keep the mobile. Nobody's going to see it. Yes, but it can be stolen. You can sell it. You, it can be damaged and thrown, yet it still can be retrieved. Even if you format your laptop or your device, specialists can still retrieve everything on it. And a friend of mine, a personal friend of mine, came to me once and he said, yesterday I went to downtown and I bought a second-hand laptop. So I took it to a friend of mine and I said, this is a sort of new laptop. Yes, it's secondhand, but it's formatted. I need you to install Windows and I need you to put all the necessary programs in it. So his friend said, okay. The following day, he brought him the laptop and he, saw, and he said to him, I restored the formatted hard disk. So now you can use the programs and the software for free. So my friend opened the laptop and he was shocked by the photos that were restored from a hard disk that was formatted and everything was erased and deleted. And he said, Wallahi, I was so shocked. Alhamdulillah, he has Iman. He said, I immediately closed the uh, laptop and asked my friend to format it again, I don't want to retrieve anything. He said, I saw photos of women, Muslims, hijabis, who are not in hijab, who are in very intimate positions, thinking that this is only between me and my husband. So my take against this is that a woman's chastity, a woman's privacy, a Muslim as body is more sacred than to be preserved or captured just for a silly reason as we're friends get together we would like to to film a video and allah azza wa knows best and with this we come to the conclusion of today's
lesson until we meet, insha'Allah. Um, today is Monday. Thursday, I'll leave you. Fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.